When I was nine years old, I remember in the middle of the night, I was watching TV and see the first man put steps onto the moon. I'm now 57, and for the past two years, I've been privileged enough to lead the Rosetta project, to escort and land the Philae probe on a comet. We achieved both last year with a landing on November 12th. I'd like to take you on that journey. Now, why do we want to visit comets? Besides being known for their appearance on the sky, which looks impressive, comets are related to, according to theory, to delivering water on Earth in the very early phases of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. They may also have delivered building blocks of life to Earth to bootstrap the emergence of life on Earth. Now, what happened soon after that is that comets migrated outwards in the solar system because of gravity interactions with Jupiter and Saturn, and they moved to beyond the orbit of Neptune, and they've been sitting there ever since. So when you're able to capture a comet nowadays, which is fresh into the solar system, then you're looking back four and a half billion years in time, and you can actually see which stuff was around when Earth was formed and life emerged. The Rosetta mission was actually thought of in the early 80s and was quickly approved after the success of the ESA mission Giotto to the comet of Halley. Rosetta was supposed to be launched in 2003 to the comet Wirtanen, which is about a kilometer in size, but that actually wasn't possible. There was a problem with the Ariane rocket, and we had to delay the launch. Now, in planetary science, if you delay a launch, it means you have to find another body, because they move around and you can't just randomly go there. So we had to find another comet, which was fresh into the solar system, and this particular comet for the first time was discovered in the early 60s, and they have been able to calculate back that its first entry into the solar system was in 1959. What happens is that out there, beyond the orbit of Neptune, these comets sometimes run into each other, and their orbits slightly deviate. Then they get pulled in by the gravity of Jupiter, and they go into the interior of the solar system. Of course, it meant that we had made a thousand Delft blue plates with the wrong comet on it, but I've never had to buy any China since, is the good news. <laughs> Now, how do you actually get to a comet? You can't take enough fuel, because you need 10 times more fuel than the whole satellite would weigh. So what you do is you use gravitational slingshots. You use the planet's velocity around the sun. You approach with your satellite the planet from behind, and you then use it to accelerate you. You then get that velocity for free. And you also can deviate the course so that you can get into more elliptical orbits so that you can get further out into the solar system. I'll show a graph of that later on. Now, we went by Earth, then we flew by Mars, then Earth again, and then Earth again. In the meantime, we also visited a few asteroids, and this took us into deep space. Now, what did we do on these flybys? Did we just wait until we arrived at the comet to achieve our science? No, we didn't. <coughs> This gives you a feeling of what we did on the way. The top two panels are infrared images taken by an instrument on Rosetta, called Virtis. The bottom two are from actually a satellite which is in orbit around Earth, called Envisat. And that has a similar instrument. And when you compare these, you see that in the two highlighted areas, you actually... Wait a minute, two highlighted areas. Um, you actually see that there is a lot of similarity between these regions. So this is what we do to calibrate our detectors, to make sure that we understand how they work. Another thing that we did was we took, when we flew, flew by Mars, we made a selfie. The word didn't exist, by the way, in 2007, but still. This is taken by the SIVA camera, which is on the Philae lander, which at the time was still bolted onto the back of the Rosetta spacecraft. <coughs> Here you see how we flew. It's the white trajectory. We started with a circular orbit at the place where the Earth is around the Sun, and you see it getting more and more elliptical. And at the very end, it almost is similar to the orbit of the comet, which is the elliptical orbit indicated in gray. And in May 2014, we got to the comet. But then we had to act. Because we had to overtake the comet, we were going much faster than the comet. Actually, we were going 2,800 kilometers per hour faster than we should to encounter the comet. So we had to break. We did that in eight steps. Why eight steps? Well, actually, if you get that close to a comet, the position of the comet is not known accurately enough to go there. Your GPS doesn't stop at the comet. 
So what we do is we look where the comet is, then we break, we look again and reorientate ourselves and move. So we did this in eight steps. Now to give you a feeling for how big these maneuvers are, between step two and three, that was a seven hour maneuver where we burned 215 kilos of fuel. All these maneuvers together burned 500 kilos of fuel. That's one third of all the fuel Rosetta had with it. But then in the end we arrived at the comet. During these maneuvers, we found something else. We were reminded of the fact that the solar arrays of Rosetta, which are horribly big because you need to be able to get enough energy as far out into the solar system as Jupiter. And this is one wing. There are two of these wings. And at the bottom, these are not specially selected small people. They're just like you and me. <laughs> so this thing really is big. It's 65 square meters of solar array. Now, what we saw at the end of one of these maneuvers is what you see here. At the left, you see the graph coming down, and that's when the engine stopped. But then normally, you should get a straight line because you have a constant velocity. But we didn't get a straight line. We saw a wiggle. And the wiggle had a size, of a velocity size of 3 millimeters per second and a period of 13 seconds. Now, we were scratching our head for a long time. What is this? Well, what it is, is this. It's the solar wings of Rosetta flapping because you stop pushing the spacecraft. These things have to relax and it takes time. Now also to bear, you have to bear in mind that we measured the velocity here of three millimeters per second on a spacecraft which was going at 50,000 kilometers per hour. Now this is rocket science. <laughs> <coughs> Another thing which you get with these large solar arrays, the comet is outgassing and actually pushes a lot of gas into space. This gas flows by the Rosetta spacecraft, and Rosetta gets pushed away. In green, you see the line, which is the limit of our navigation camera, what we can tolerate. And you see that we actually exceeded it twice because our models were not good enough yet. And what you then get is what you see in this looping animation. You see Rosetta getting closer and closer to the comet, but you see, also see the comet going down into the field of view and actually disappearing. What happens is rather simple. We plan our observations based on predicted trajectories. So we think the comet is there. But when actually we're pushed away, we look there and we don't see the comet anymore. So these are all the effects we have to compensate for when we fly a spacecraft. Of course, when we got there, we couldn't resist another selfie, this time with uh, the comet in the field of view. And what you can also nicely see from the illumination on the comet is that the sun is shining from the lower left. You also see that, by the way, on the position of the solar arrays, which are oriented in exactly the same way. When we really got close, we saw this. And this was not a nice surprise. We had hoped for some kind of smooth, potato-like body where you could say, yeah, that's the X, that's where we're going to land. In this particular case, we had to carefully study because we have uncertainty in landing, and the uncertainty circle is about a kilometer. And remember, this comet is four kilometers in size. So that's, that's a fairly big area. We managed at the end to find an area which was smooth enough to be acceptable, still scientifically interesting. Now, when we were around the comet and not yet landed, we also did a number of measurements. This is a fairly complex story, but I'll explain it as simple as I can make it. On Earth, water exists in two flavors, normal water and heavy water. The ratio of these two tells you the pedigree of the water in the solar system. Where was the planet formed? The inner solar system had a low ratio, then it went up to the outside, and then further out it went down again. So if we, wanna, if we think that these comets brought water to Earth, we have to explain whether they have the right ratio. Now, there is a group of comets, which is indicated here, which comes from much further away, which we know are not compatible with water on Earth. There is another group of comets, and the, the left two of these inside the box were actually measured after Rosetta was launched. So we had high hopes for these type of comets to be it. Lo and behold, our first measurement that we did, we saw a ratio of heavy water to normal water, incompatible with that of Earth. So it can't have been this type of comets that brought water to Earth. Did we go to the wrong comet? No, because you can still learn a lot. Probably this tells us that water on Earth was delivered not by a single branch of comets, but by multiple types of comets, because there is not a single family of comets which has the right mix. 
And probably it also tells us that the Jupiter family of comets, as they are called, which everybody thought that they originated from the same place in the original solar system, apparently didn't. So we learn a lot about the history of the solar system. And this is how it works in science. You ask one question, you get 10 new ones. And if you're lucky, you get an answer. Um, the comet itself, the images, nobody ever thought that a comet would look like this. You see cliffs, you see dust, you see small boulders, you see structure in these cliffs. There is a whole different geology that nobody ever thought you would find on a comet. And this, we learn a lot about how these comets actually start to be comets and how they form and how they evolve over time. We also see things like this. On the left-hand side, you see something which looks like wind-blown uh, dunes and shadows behind rocks, wind-blown shadows. Now, we know these from Mars, because on Mars this is fairly normal. But Mars has an atmosphere, and this comet doesn't. So it's pretty difficult to have wind-blown shadows. What probably is the case here is that this is material which lifted off into space and later on came back onto the comet. And that probably explains what you see here. <coughs> There is another feature, which you see best in the right-hand side of the picture. There's a crack running through the neck of the comet. It looks a bit like a duck, so we have a neck and a body and a head. But this is not a small crack. It's 70 centimeters wide and two kilometers long. And actually, there are people who suggest and hope that during its closest approach to the sun in, on the 13th of August of this year, this comet will split in two. And then we'll have to decide which comet to go for. Go we there or there? <laughs> this is another image. It's overexposed to show you these jets, the white stripes coming out of the comet. Now, we saw these already months ago, but then when the comet rotated into the shadow, because it has a day-night cycle, just like Earth, they always disappeared. But these jets are actually in an area which half an hour ago went into the shadow. So apparently the comet is now hot enough for this thing to keep on outgassing all the time. And this is what we see with Gozetta. We have more and more trouble navigating around the comet because we are blown away, there's dust, it's trouble all over the place. Landing on the comet. How did we do it? To illustrate a bit how you do that, you see here in white the trajectory from the bottom right that Rosetta flew on the way to the comet. One of the things which is crucial here is that the filet lander is passive. It has no control. It's like a dart. You throw it into space, and if you're lucky, you hit the bullseye. So what we had to do is halfway through this trajectory, where the red points are our control points, whether everything is still right and we would OK the next one, we took a left turn, a sharp left turn, towards the comet. This was necessary because we had to aim the lander to go in the right direction. <clears throat> the lander then traveled for seven hours, and again there, seven hours is 25,000 seconds. If we had pushed this thing off with one centimeter per second wrong, we would have been wrong by 252 meters. So when we did this, we had to know the velocity of Rosetta better than a centimeter per second, and the position in space of the spacecraft better than 100 meters, and this at a distance of 500 million kilometers. Again, rocket science. <laughs> this was the approach of the lander to the comet. These images were taken by the OSIRIS camera on the Rosetta spacecraft with the lander getting more distant. And you see it getting smaller and smaller. And the top right, you see one of the images the lander took just before landing on the comet. It has a camera at the bottom, so it was looking down. And this was taken at an altitude of roughly 60 meters. The boulder on the top right, to give you an impression, is some 10 meters in diameter. So again, you see a large diversity of what the comet looks like. Of course, then we had the story of landing, or rather not. From the bottom left to the top, you see the trajectory. We took images afterwards, and we could see the lander flying over the comet. Then the top two panels in the middle actually show you the before and the after image. And you clearly see the surface has changed. But there is one thing missing, a lander. We were lucky enough, however, that that particular image in the very far right we saw a bright dot which wasn't there before, and that was the lander traveling. So what happened here, you see on the middle graph, the lander touched the comet, went up again, went down and up and down. Now actually to interpret this, because this is the distance from the center of the comet, 
To really interpret this, you have to subtract the surface of the comet, because it's very wild. So you have to get the distance from the surface. And that's in this graph. And you now clearly see what happened. It landed, it bounced in some bit wild pattern, then went down again, then went up over a rift or ridge of a crater. That's why it looks like it's going down. It hit the surface, did a little bounce, and then it got there. The funny part here is that Filet was originally designed to be bouncing over the comet to investigate more areas. That was descoped because it was way too expensive. Now, we forgot, but Filet remembered. <laughs> so where did the lander at the end actually go? You see in green the aim circle of our original point that we wanted to get to. The red is where we touched down. That's 120 meters from the original position. Then you see the blue one, which was the last observed point, and the yellow circle is where we looked for the lander. From later data, we now know that we actually, the comet is inside a circle, which is indicated here, an ellipse of 16 by 160 meters. And we have images of that area, before and after. And you see them here. The left one is before, the two right ones is after. Now you see a bright dot, but the debate is open on whether that bright dot was actually visible in the original image or not, or it might have been in the shadow. So whether this is the lander, we don't know. But one thing we do know, this image is for me the image of space science of the last decade. It's a lander, a man-made object, its foot standing on the surface of the comet. Then of course we learned a lot about the comet. And I'm not going to summarize all of this, but you've heard me call this thing a rock. Actually, it would float when you throw it in water. It is half the density of water. So this is not a rock. It's a fluffy aggregate of dust particles which hang together. And then, of course, landing day itself. I will never forget the excitement. Actually, one of the pictures has me somewhere in there. <laughs> all these newspapers, these headlines, I can only hope that I, as I, as a nine-year-old, was watching TV and see the guy set foot on the moon, there is another young person or a lot of young persons out there who saw this happen and will go into space science. With that, I would like to thank you.